Good evening. Welcome. I am Ann Shea, the president of the Illinois Patrons of the Arts in the Vatican Museums. The Illinois Patrons are part of an international network dedicated to supporting the artistic treasures of the 12 museums, which comprise the Vatican Museums, that is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. To those of you who have been with us before, it's good to have you back. Tonight, the fourth program in our Rosa Mystica series is Mary, the Mother of All Nations. Mary continues to be a constant and present to all of us, no matter who or where we are. In designing tonight's program, our design team explored images of Mary used in the Chicago steel mills to her representation as the Bachi Mama in South America. We also drew on viewer feedback. Thank you to those of you who submitted survey responses to our first three Rosa Mystica programs. Many of you wrote to us commenting on how important it was to view the Marian art tradition from artistic and theological perspectives. In particular, at this time of the pandemic, it was not only intellectually informative, but comforting and consoling. We hope this evening's focus on Marian art that reflects Mary as the universal mother will take us down the path further of art appreciation and broadening our faith. At this time, I would also like to acknowledge our many benefactors who have made the Rosa Mystica initiative possible. Our major supporters include the ACTA Foundation, the Maza Foundation, the Shaw Family Supporting Foundation, the Richard H. Driehaus Charitable Lee Trust, and the Stella Maris Fund. Our host for the entire Rosa Mystica series and this evening's program is Father Louis Camelli. He is Cardinal Supage's Delegate for Formation and Mission and a member of the Illinois Patrons Board of Directors. Father Camelli. Thank you, Anne. And I want to echo your words of welcome to this fourth session of the Rosa Mystica series. In the first session, there was a presentation of a painting that belongs to the patrimony of the Archdiocese of Chicago. It's entitled The Annunciation. Uh, the artist is unknown, uh, but there's been some work done on it that would seem to suggest it goes back to the 14th or 15th century and possibly the school of Ghirlandaio in Florence. And you may know that the School of Ghirlandaio was the place where Michelangelo did his apprenticeship. This painting that was discovered at Mundelein Seminary was in need of restoration and conservation. And the patrons of the arts in the Vatican Museum, of course, have a mission to restore and support restoration efforts in the Vatican Museums. But it also seemed opportune for the Illinois chapter uh, to take up this project with the Annunciation painting. And so this painting has been entrusted to the Conservation Center in Chicago. And along the way, we have been watching the development of the process, fascinating process of restoration and conservation. So there's a short video now, and I invite you to watch it and see where we are in progress towards the full restoration of this painting, The Annunciation. The Conservation Center is honored to assist the patrons of the arts with this important conservation project. The following video features our conservators conducting treatment on The Annunciation. Hello, my name is Amber Shabdak, and I am the Senior Painting Conservator at the Conservation Center. As of this moment, we are entering into a more cosmetic phase of the treatment. So far, we have removed grime, discolored varnish, and old repaint. We have also consolidated splits and paint losses in the panel. Now we are on to loss compensation. In areas of ground and paint loss, we are filling and texturing a spackle to imitate the thickness and surface qualities of the paint surrounding the loss. The original layer, called the ground, is a preparatory layer the artist uses 
to prepare a panel surface for oil paint. The ground is composed of a gesso, usually made of an animal glue and chalk mixed together. Conservators often use this traditional recipe to fill losses as it is compatible with the original ground layer, but we also use commercial fillers that are very similar. We apply it with a micro spatula and let it dry. Then we go in with small cotton swabs and clean up any excess. What is left fills the loss and levels it, like spackling a hole in your wall. We will then apply a first layer of varnish brushed on to saturate the paint layer, but also it will allow any ghosting of the spackle in the cracks to disappear. We are now ready for in-painting, which will be discussed during the final event of this treatment. This is Josh McCauley, Senior Conservator of Frames and Gilding at the Conservation Center. The initial phase of the frame treatment was to remove the bronze paint. Removal tests were conducted to determine if it was possible to remove the overpaint without disturbing the original gilded layer. The overpaint, unfortunately, was oil-based and impossible to remove without causing damage to the oil gilding underneath. The burnished water gilding, however, was not affected by the removal process. Due to the previous restorations, it was decided to proceed with removing the bronze paint and oil gilding, leaving the original water gilding and gesso layer intact. Then the previous fills were mechanically removed by various means, uh, scalpels and small other chisels. The next step was to consolidate the gesso layer and prevent further loss. The loss compensation was done with traditional gesso made of rabbit skin glue and calcium carbonate, which most people know as chalk. Once applied, the fills were shaped to match the surrounding areas by various means with tools and other wet processes. After all the fills were completed, a thin layer of yellow bowl was applied to all the exposed gesso. Bowl is a traditional clay and rabbit skin glue mixture that is applied onto the gesso to further refine the surface and influence the color tone of the gold leaf. Select areas will also receive a layer of red bowl in the final phase before gilding with gold leaf. I'm delighted to be able to introduce this part of our presentation. It's a little bit different, not quite the same as the uh, other sessions that we've had uh, for a couple of reasons. Instead of uh, one image, focusing on one image, we have uh, a number of images of Mary, mother of Jesus, and we also have three people who are gonna offer commentary. You know, Mary, the mother of the Lord, is a, an individual, uh, singular, certainly in her role in the whole unfolding of salvation history. Uh, although she is singular in her personhood, she has a kind of universal value, and, and that's manifested in the ways in which she has been represented artistically across the centuries. So interesting. And uh, she is indeed, as the title of this session reflects, uh, the mother of all nations. So uh, now we're going to uh, view some images of her uh, and there'll be some commentary, three people offering commentary. First of all, someone that um, is familiar to us, uh, Rebecca Long who is the uh, Patrick G. and Shirley W. Ryan Associate Curator of European Art at the Art Institute of Chicago. And then we're going to have 
Dr. Mary Ellen O'Hare Lavin, who is a psychologist. She is a Jungian psychologist and um, has also been a psychotherapist. And, and she's going to offer another perspective, a psychological perspective on the images of Mary. And finally, we'll have uh, Jack Shea. Uh, many of you are familiar with Jack, who is uh, just a wonderful uh, theologian, storyteller, poet, and someone who has a gift for leading people into theological reflection. And he will take a look at these images from the perspective of theology and spirituality. So I invite you now to uh, listen to these uh, commentaries and uh, to contemplate the image of Mary, the mother of the Lord, Mary, the mother of all nations. On March 15th of 2020, with a pandemic raging through Italy, Pope Francis made a mini pilgrimage through the city of Rome, as we see in this um, striking news photo here, in which he stopped at two sites associated with prayers for relief from pestilence. The first stop was the, ch the church of San Marcello in Corso. Um, he's walking right here. You see the um, Vittorio Emanuele monument behind him, and he's walking at, down the beginning of the Corso. Um, the church contains a miraculous crucifix that was carried in procession through districts of Rome during an outbreak of plague in the year 1522. The second stop on this pilgrimage last spring was Santa Maria Maggiore, the fifth century basilica which houses the image known as the Salus Populi Romani, the protect, protectress of the Roman people. Pope Francis has a deep connection with this icon. He prayed before it the day after his election as pontiff, and he returns to it before and after every foreign trip. Tradition has it that St. Luke himself painted the icon of the Virgin and Child under the instruction of Mary herself, and that St. Helen, the mother of Constantine the Great, found it in Jerusalem in the fourth century. Um, here you see the painting itself out of its frame. The icon is related to a Byzantine type known as the Hodogetria, or she who points the way. In this style of icon, the Virgin holds the Christ child, whose divinity is indicated by the nimbus around his head, which is, and it's hard to see here because of the poor state of the condition of the painting, his nimbus is inscribed with a cross. The writing across the top of the panel is an abbreviation of Mother of God in Greek. In 1838, Pope Gregory XVI crowned the image on the Feast of the Assumption, and in 1954, Pius XII initiated the very first Marian year with a procession of the icon through the streets of Rome. Francis ordered the conservation of the image by the Vatican Museums in 2018. But the icon's place in Rome dates back much further to an earlier age of plague and pilgrimage and procession. In November of 589, the Tiber River overflowed its banks, decimating grain storage, washing away buildings, and apparently resulting in the city being overrun with snakes. Two months later, plague reappeared in the city. This outbreak of the bubonic plague was an aftershock of the so-called Plague of Justinian, which raged Europe and the Middle East from uh, the year 541 to 542. The outbreaks and its aftershocks uh, killed as many as 25 million people worldwide. Justinian's secretary and biographer says that in Constantinople alone, 5,000 people died per day for the course of, over the course of four months, with the height of the plague killing 10,000 people daily, figures that sound disturbingly familiar to us today. The bubonic plague would occur uh, every few decades across Europe and across the world, aside from the Americas, um, for the next 200 years. One of the first victims of the plague in um, Rome in 589 was the Pope Pelagius II. Um, his 
uh, his follower um, was elected as Pope Gregory the Great, a man of tremendous abilities and talents who melded a profound contemplative prayer life with an extraordinary talent for administration that he brought forth in the very early months of panic and plague of his um, papacy. One of his first acts was to lead a penitential procession through the streets of Rome to Santa Maria Maggiore in 590. Um, and this was to seek her intercession and intervention in the relief of the plague. For this event, Gregory had the Salus Populi Romani, this painting, brought to Rome from Constantinople. And he and the Romans prayed desperately for her intercession, which was so severe, the plague that was so severe that 80 participants died during the course of this procession itself. Um, from that point on, the image of the Salus Populi Romani, the Madonna del Popolo in Italian, the Madonna of the Roman people, was cemented in the city's identity. Our Lady of Guadalupe is another Marian image famous worldwide. Uh, a title of the Blessed Vir Virgin Mary associated with a series of Marian apparitions in Mexico in December of 1531. Um, and an image of, uh, a venerated image on the cloak that enshrined, is enshrined within the Basilica of Guadalupe outside of Mexican, Mexico City today. Um, it is the most visited Catholic shrine in the world. Um, over the course of her feast days of December 11th and 12th, um, 6.1 million pilgrims on average per year visit her shrine. She's considered the patroness of Mexico and the continental Americas. She's also venerated by Native Americans on the account of the devotion calling for the conversion of all of the Americas. Replicas of the miraculous image uh, that's on your screen can be found in thousands of churches around the world where processions also occur, including here in Illinois and an annual feast day procession from Chicago to Des Plaines that draws a crowd second only to Mexico City across the world. It's organized by a family original from, originally from Michoacan, Mexico, with a special devotion to the Virgin of Guadalupe, and it draws hundreds of thousands of people every year. The history of the cult of Guadalupe explains that the Virgin Mary appeared four times to a man named Juan Diego, and once more to his uncle. The first apparition occurred on the morning of December, Saturday, December 9th, 1531, when the indigenous Mexican peasant Juan Diego experienced a vision of a young woman on the hill of Tepeyac, which later became a suburb of Mexico City. According to the accounts of this vision, the woman speaking to him in his native Nahuatl language identified herself as the Virgin Mary, the mother of the true deity. She was said to have asked for a church to be erected at that site in her honor. Based on her words, Juan Diego then went uh, to seek out the Archbishop of Mexico City to tell him what had happened. Not unexpectedly, perhaps, the bishop did not believe Diego. Later the same day, he saw the same young woman in a second apparition, and she asked him to continue insisting. This is a trope that is fre frequently seen in the histories of miraculous images and apparitions across the world, that they occur or inspired in natives or in members of lower classes of society whose vision or perceived lack of societal worth makes it difficult for their authority figures to believe them or to believe in their personal gifts. The following day, uh, December 10th, Juan Diego spoke to the Archbishop a second time. Um, he, the Bishop instructed him to return to Tepeyac and to ask the woman for a miraculous sign to prove her identity. Later that day, the third apparition occurred when Juan Diego returned to the hill. Encountering her again, he reported her request, uh, he reported to her the request for a sign of proof, which she said she would provide the following day. That day, however, his uncle became ill um, and he wasn't able to return to the hill. He did sneak back to the hill in the early morning hours of Tuesday, December 12th. Um, he was going to get a priest for his uncle and was embarrassed that the Virgin Mary would see him avoiding her. He was trying to take a roundabout way um, around the hill. Um, she intercepted him on his way and asked where he was going. This is the fourth 
apparition. And in some copies of this miraculous image in the empty corners of the canvas around the central image of the Virgin Mary, you'll see the apparitions depicted uh, to Juan Diego. He explained what happened with his uncle's illness and the Virgin gently chided him for not having reached out to her. In the words which have become the most famous phrase of the Guadalupe apparitions and are inscribed above the main entrance of the basilica there, she asked, am I not here, who, I who am your mother? She assured him that his uncle had recovered and told him to gather flowers from the summit of the Tepeyac Hill, um, which in the middle of December would normally have been barren. Juan Diego obeyed her and at the top of the hill he found a miraculous appearance of Castilian roses, which are not native to Mexico. The Virgin Mary arranged the flowers in his tilma, a type of cloak that was worn by indigenous, the indigenous people. And when he opened it later before the archbishop, the flowers fell to the floor and revealed on the fabric, the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe. The archbishop kept Juan Diego's cloak first in his private chapel and then in the church on public display where it attacked to great attention. On December 26, 1531, a procession formed to transfer the image back to Tepeyac Hill, where they installed it in a small, hastily erected chapel. During this procession, the first miracle was performed um, when a native man was mortally wounded by an accidental arrow shot. The people carried him before the image of Guadalupe and pleaded for his life, and he fully recovered. Juan Diego's tilma has become Mexico's most popular religious and cultural symbol, and it has received widespread ecclesiastical and popular veneration. In the 19th century, it became a rallying cry of Spaniards born in America and what they denominated New Spain. They said they considered the apparitions as legitimizing their own indigenous uh, Mexican origin. They infused it with an almost messianic sense of mission and identity and thereby also used it to justify their rebellion against Spain. Guadalupe continues to be a mixture of cultures blended from Mexico, both racially and religiously. The first mestiza or the first Mexican, bringing uh, first true Mexican, bringing together people of um, distinct cultural heritages while at the same time affirming their, um, their distinctiveness. The Nobel laureate Octavio Paz wrote in 1974, the Mexican people after more than two centuries of experiments and defeats have faith only in the Virgin of Guadalupe and the national lottery. Potosi in current day Bolivia lies at the foot of the so-called Cerro de Potosi, the hill of Potosi in the Andes. The hill itself, which is often referred to as the Cerro Rico, the rich mountain. Um, it was popularly conceived of as being made of, literally made of the, the whole mountain itself, silver ore, and it dominates, as you can see in the photo um, in the center of your screen, it dominates the physical setting of the city of Potosi. Um, it provided vast quantities of silver for Spain during the period of their global empire. It is estimated in this period that 80% of the silver produced in the world at this time came from Potosi. As a result of mining operations in the city, um, or in the mountain, the city became one of the largest in the New World. The mine itself was accidentally discovered in 1545, um, and again we have the central role of a native man um, in this story. He was a Quechua uh, silver miner named Diego de Hualpa. He was working for the Spanish who had sent him into the mountain or up the mountain um, looking for an Inca shrine that could have potentially been plundered for silver. After centuries of mining methods that severely depleted the local ecology, the mountain continues to be mined for silver and tin to this day. Due to poor worker conditions, many of the miners across the centuries have contracted silicosis. The average life expectancy of a miner in Potosi today is around 40 years. Um, it is still a significant contributor to the country's economy and employs some 15,000 miners today. Mercury poison is also common due to its use in the extraction process. Um, conditions at the mines and in the refining patios caused the deaths of millions of miners during the period of Spanish rule. Um, some historians have speculated as many 
has 8 million miners in total. And I think it doesn't need to be said that these miners were uh, forced labor and that they were by the great majority indigenous people. The mountain itself had been thought to be female. Um, in the indigenous Andean culture, mountains represent Pachamama um, or Mother Earth. The Spanish conquerors understood her importance culturally and she became in their hands synonymous with the Virgin Mary, helping to convert the indigenous to Catholicism and to the intricacies of its belief system. This association is particularly evident in Potosí's most famous images, the Virgin of Potosí, or the Virgin of the Cerro Rico, in which the Virgin Mary literally becomes the mountain of Potosí, which you see in the painting on the left of the screen. And on the right of the screen is an early um, topographic de depiction of the mountain. I think you can see the very distinct forms, the um, upper hill and then the lower hill, which are factored um, both into the map and into the painting of, of the Virgin of the Mountain. Sorry, go back there. Um, the top of the painting is dominated by the Holy Trinity with Jesus at the left, the Holy Spirit as a dove in the center and God the Father at the right. They are blessing Mary as the Queen of Heaven. The painting encodes the discovery of the silver mine by the Andean man Hualpa in 1545. So it's hard to see on um, the screen, but um, you can actually, when the image is larger, you can see the figures making their way up the mountain. At one point in the narrative, he argues with the local indigenous leader about whether to reveal his findings to the Spaniards. And that leader is the man in sort of the mid ground. You can see Hualpa as the small figure and the indigenous leader the Coraca is the larger man with a, a gilded staff. Um, the mountain scene is filled with anecdotal scenes of life. The miners climb up the mountain and llamas graze. Um, the mine workers at Potosí believed the Virgin of the Mountain to be responsible for helping them during the countless accidents that punctuated mine life. At the bottom of the painting, saints kneel beneath the Virgin and the figure at the far right may be the painting's patron. Additionally, uh, the text that's barely visible at the bottom of the painting um, tells of the central roles in religion and governance in the Vice Royalty of Peru, which Bol modern day Bolivia was a part of. Um, the important roles that are played by the two figures on either side of the figure of the earth, the Pope and the Spanish King. Paintings like this appealed to local, local viewers in Potosí by showing the familiar landscape, the mountain that dominates the town through a scrim of divine intercession. In short, paintings made otherworldly manifest in a very local world. The Virgin was a familiar subject rooted in the figure of a local divine mother goddess who was embedded within Andean culture. As divine mothers, both Pachamama and later the Virgin Mary of the Hill were intercessors between the local believers and the divine. Thank you. When I was a young child, May was one of my favorite months. It was the beginning of warm weather, summer vacation was around the corner, and Mother Earth was blessing us with her gifts. For those of you who attended Catholic school, you may remember the good sisters setting up May altars in the classroom where we sang songs to Mary each morning and someone, usually a little girl, was chosen to crown Mary queen of heaven and earth with a garland of flowers. The whole month of May was devoted to Mary, the divine feminine, mother of God and our mother. At the time, I was deeply moved by this celebratory archetypal ritual, and I even set up a small altar at home in my bedroom to honor her. The Virgin Mother Mary, Queen of Heaven and Earth, is just one aspect of the archetypal feminine divine. As a child, I did not know about archetypal patterns of behavior, but I knew the idea of having a divine mother associated with the protective maternal aspect of the feminine, whom I could turn to in times of need or discomfort or even joy, was available to me expressed in images placed before me by the church where I worshiped and the school I attended.
This feminine divine image I knew as a child was white skinned and she often appeared in a blue mantle holding a small child in her arms. In the field of psychology, there is a phenomenon identified as transference. In the clinical environment, it is an unconscious process by which a patient projects on the clinician and or the clinician projects back on the person who has come for help and information through therapy. In psychology, we call this projection a shadow projection. The shadow can be positive or it can be negative, but it is part of the unconscious we carry within ourselves. The reality is we project our inner experience and ideas onto others. We cannot not project, it's part of being human. We do the same with art. Art is often used as a vulnerary to heal wounds of the psyche. Viewing a piece of art embodies a kind of transference. We view art using a lens we bring into the encounter. There's a psychological dialogue that goes on between the piece of art and a person's psyche. Art is spirit made visible, through which the spirit of the time manifests outward and as a medium through which there is a dialogue with the soul. It's almost as if the spiritual and the psychological share the same DNA, like a double helix. As I grew older and enjoyed the opportunity to live and travel and study and work in Europe during the 1970s, I was introduced to a lesser known Mary image prevalent throughout Europe in both the Roman Catholic tradition and farther east in the Orthodox Byzantine tradition. She was dark skinned and was often referred to as the Black Madonna. In Europe, there are between five and 600 shrines devoted to Black Madonna images, primarily in France, Spain, Poland, Switzerland, Sicily, Belgium, Germany, England, Ireland, and Luxembourg, not counting those of the Coptic Catholic tradition in Northern Africa, south of the Mediterranean, and in Latin America. These images are usually venerated in churches, in monastery chapels, and other sacred spaces. The images are often clothed in elaborate dresses adorned with spectacular jewelry and precious stones. The clothing is often changed to symbolize the season or the feast. Occasionally, the image is a holy icon. Shrines with images of Black Madonnas draw large venerating crowds all year long throughout Europe. Many of the images are carved of stone, while others are carved of hard wood, like ebony. Some of them portray Mary seated with the child in her lap. They are usually about 30 inches tall and have a mystery about them. The first mystery is where did they come from? And secondly, why are they dark and sometimes black? There are several speculations about where they came from and why they are black, but nothing is definite about their origin. My understanding is the first dark images of Mary with a child in her arms appeared around the third century in Northern Africa, created by Coptic Christian priests. People in that area are dark skinned and perhaps the priests were emulating the skin tones of the locals. Traders on ships in the Mediterranean may have returned to the Middle East with these dark images. Later in the 11th, 12th, and 13th century, they may have been brought to Europe by returning crusaders. Some writers attribute the dark skin color to soot accumulated from devotional candles left burning before the images over the years. Some say because the images were carved from dark ebony wood, they are black, or due to the deterioration of pigment in lead-based paints, they may have been painted over with dark paint in an attempt to restore them. It's all speculation. Nothing is for certain. Years ago, an elderly friend of mine took me to the shrine of the Black Madonna of Mercy in the village of Alt Oettingen in Bavaria. Alt Oettingen is about 30 miles east of Munich. She shared with me the story of her experience of the Black Madonna of Mercy. My friend's story took place shortly after her spouse had been inducted into Hitler's army in the early 1940s. She was alone and almost nine months pregnant with their first child. 
At the time, she decided to visit the Black Madonna in Alt Oettingen to pray for her spouse's safety. When unexpectedly and a bit early, she began to experience labor pains. <clears throat> she prayed to the Black Madonna that she would arrive home safely to Wasserberg am Inn in time to give birth to her child in the bed of her mother where she herself had been born. She was quite young and terribly frightened, but arrived home in time to birth her son. In view of the circumstances, my friend considered this a miracle through the intercession of the Black Madonna. Stories like this about the intercession of a Black Madonna are told and retold all over Europe. Material representations of the Black Madonna stimulate a recognition and resonance with the living healing archetype. Darkness, which can imply energy and mystery, can be transformative, a place to work throughout and problem solve. The journey to pray to the Black Madonna is not only about traveling to a particular place, but also about a journey to the depths within, a pilgrimage to the shrine of our own inner darkness. Through this journey, we are able to gain insight and self-awareness. We are able to acknowledge and work with dark aspects of the self. Often there's a feeling that something that before seemed insurmountable to traverse had now dissolved. Peacefulness can come through the intercession. For some reason, there has been little devotion to the dark-skinned black Madonna and her dark-skinned child, Jesus, here in the North American Catholic Church, except by those who brought the dark images of the homeland with them when they immigrated to North America. About, I'm going to tell you a story about three unknown Black Madonnas here in the Chicago area. There's a shrine on the southeast side of Chicago in the once prosperous area that harbors the now defunct steel mills. The parish name is St. Jude's and its parishioners are mostly hardworking Hispanics. Within the church is a shrine to Our Lady of Guadalupe. In Mexico, the entire country is dedicated to Our Lady of Guadalupe. She is dark skinned and associated with empowerment, transformation, and change. But she does not cradle a child in her arms, as the title of Madonna would indicate. The image of Our Lady of Guadalupe is dressed in the Aztec tradition and she wears a dark sash around her waist, symbolizing she is pregnant, pregnant with Jesus. In Mexico today, she is considered to be the protector of unborn children. The child is in his mother's dark womb, preparing to be born and reveal himself to us. Also in South Chicago, on the southeast side, is another image. Not far from St. Jude's Parish and the church is St. Michael's. It is my understanding that in the 1920s, large groups of Polish came here to relocate and to work in those same mills. When they came, they brought with them an icon of a black Madonna called Our Lady of Czestochowa, an image that was considered sacred in their native Poland. Czestochowa is just outside Krakow. Just as the black Madonnas of the Middle East and Europe were transported to new homes and gave comfort to those who prayed to her, these two black Madonnas, Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Czestochowa, came from other countries to Chicago. Recently, I was reminded of an image I learned about quite serendipitously several years ago. While flying to New York, I pulled the in-flight magazine from the pocket in front of me and learned of a Chicago artist, Margaret Taylor Burroughs, who had painted a black Madonna of her own. It is the image used for the advertisement of this program. At that time, Illinois State Senator Paul Simon wanted to introduce the work of Ms. Burroughs to the Illinois legislature and have them be aware of her marvelous contribution to the culture and art of the Black community here in Chicago. The airline based here in Chicago picked up on Senator Simon's initiative and published an article about Ms. Burroughs in their in-flight magazine. That is how I became aware of this local artist. Noted Swiss psychologist Carl Jung once wrote, if you are thinking about something or researching something, images 
will synchronistically appear when necessary. This image by Margaret Taylor Burroughs was just what I needed at the time. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Black Madonnas of the world, much information as well as many images can be found on the web. Good luck as you embark on your journey connecting with new images of Mary, both dark and light. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my role in our reflections on Mary, the mother of all nations, is to briefly provide some theological context for the historical artistic reflections of Rebecca and the psycho-spiritual reflections of Mary Ellen. As we develop this theological context, we will revisit the paintings Rebecca and Mary Ellen featured. Rodney Stark, in his book, The Rise of Christianity, says that when the early Christians moved into the larger Mediterranean world, they encountered pagan gods. These gods were very active, wheeling and dealing, interfering in the affairs of earth, conspiratorial and taking revenge, turning defeats into victories and victories into defeat. But the one thing Rodney Stark says, these gods did not do and had no interest in was loving people. Being passionately concerned about what happens to people was not their agenda, but it was the Christian agenda. The Christian revelation was love. God so loved the world, he sent his only son, not to condemn the world, but to save it. The one and true God was love. The entire gospel is a story of the outreach of this love to all people. Paul summed it up, in Christ, there is neither master or slave, Jew or Gentile, male or female. Divine love does not discriminate according to social ranks or even moral ranks, it just is. But how will this divine love be imaged and communicated so it touches the human heart, so that it is not only known but also felt? Of course, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the revelation itself and scripture, its inspired witness. But also, as the Christian tradition unfolded, a com complementary and immensely popular image emerged. Enter Mary, the mother of God. Enter the Madonna and child. As symbols of divine love, as carriers of the essential revelation, or as Mary Ellen told us, Mary as an image of the divine feminine. And the painters, sculptors, poets, musicians came along and praised Mary with all their arts. Since the love she revealed was universal, so were the artistic creations. Whatever country Christians were in, Mary became a member of that country. In their paintings, she dressed in their clothes and held their symbols. Since Mary carried the revelation of God's love for everyone, she was portrayed in the skins of the planet. She was painted as black, yellow, brown, red, white. She connected to and integrated the religious sensibilities of different cultures. As Rebecca told us, she moved into contact with the native earth mother goddess called Pacamana in Bolivia and was painted into the mountain, the Holy Trinity above her and the people below her. She was the one who would bring heaven to earth divine love to human striving. She took on multiple titles and names. She became what Rebecca and, and Mary Ellen called Our Lady of Chestahova, Our Lady of Altanutten, Our Lady of um, Guadalupe, and the Black Madonnas everywhere, and on and on. Wherever there were Christians, there was an image of Mary who looked like them accompanied them, carried their faith, reminding them that divine love was intimately involved in their lives. It is daunting to try to track this explosion of Mary in art and devotion, this transformation of Mary into the mother of all nations. What were the motivations? Why did Mary speak so powerfully to so many people? Why were the artists so attracted, deploying their skills in her service? Why did people seek out and pray before certain Marian paintings and statues? Why were apparitions and miraculous co so closely associated with her? What was Mary doing for people? 
Both Rebecca and Mary Ellen gave us ways forward to respond to these questions, but it is always helpful to find the seeds in the gospel of future developments in the tradition. In the Marian artistic and devotional tradition, surely an energizing origin story is the Annunciation in Luke. In fact, as Rebecca mentioned, legend has it St. Luke painted the Salus Populi Romani icon under the instruction of the Virgin Mary, not bad credentials. But the Annunciation story is about Mary finally succumbing to and cooperating with divine love. It begins with the angel Gabriel telling Mary she is full of grace and the Lord is with her. In other words, she is the beloved of God. But she is not immediately delighted with this information. In fact, the story tells us she is troubled by this greeting and has to consider in her mind what it might mean. But the angel is persuasive. Uh, he tells her about past revelations, responds to her hesitations, and eventually Mary comes to a place where she can receive divine love and cooperate with it. Her final line is, let it be done to me according to your will. Being loved by God is not just an affective state of favor. It is a mission to be undertaken. Mary, the beloved one, becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit and brings forth the child who will be God's commitment to human life. He will be the offer of divine love to all people and they will be invited to receive it and cooperate with it. But what the Marian tradition discerned was that when the two of them were together as mother and child, the message of the mediation and empowerment of divine love became powerfully attracted. It participated in and was a companion to the full gospel of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. So when we kneel, or stand, or sit before Marian art, we are not just abstractly considering divine love. Even when we are looking for intercession, it is not just pleading for outside help. When we are there, we are actively being solicited into the spirit suffused ways of living and acting. We are being invited into a relationship with that love in the center of our being, in the graced place that comes with the territory of being conceived and born. What other traditions call this the image of God in us? You see, Mary is not a sky image of God, taking us into the staggering excesses of the universe, or an elemental image that takes us into unseen component particles of all creation. She is an image of divine love in its distinctly human mode, inviting us into the destinies of flesh and blood, pressing us into the actual generation of the next moment of human well-being. In her company, we are the most we can be. I suspect, at its best, that is what is happening in Marian art and devotion. I like to see it as the communion of love and hope. When divine love is allowed in, hope emerges. When through faith, Marian imagery communicates and inspires love in us, it also generates hope. This is both hope within history and hope beyond history. We want our conditions to get better, our suffering to diminish, the threats to our lives to go away. We take them to Mary to help us to know the way. We work for hope within history. But we also know living and dying are what we are about. We pray to Mary to guide us through the transition of dying into new life. She is our companion to hope beyond history. All this happens and so much more when art and faith come together. So in that spirit, let us return again to some of what Rebecca and Mary Ellen brought to us. We watch Pope Francis move through Rome, visiting the icon Salus Populi Romani during our current epidemic pandemic. We think of all the people before him who have traveled with this icon through plagues, 
not only focusing on their prayers, but striving for love among themselves. In that spirit, we hear the words of Our Lady of Guadalupe to Juan Diego. Am I not here? I, who am your mother? And we know from the highest to the lowest, we are accompanied by caring love and roses can be gathered even in December. In that spirit, Polish immigrants in Chicago bring Our Lady of Czestochowa into a new world. We know the Black Madonna is carrying their courage. In that spirit, we hear of a frightened young pregnant woman finding the bed of her mother to give birth in. She tells us Mary, under the title she knows her, had a hand in making it all happen. All we can say is, it sounds like Mary. We sense the deep truth of all this because we are people built to open into the mystery of divine love and have it inspire hope in us. Under the impress of Marian art and devotion, this truth about our true identity comes home to us. When it does, we reach, reach for the prayer we were taught. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Thank you so much to our speakers, Rebecca Long, Mary Ellen O'Hare Lavin, and Jack Shea. This has really been an interesting program. I would now like to introduce Father Jack Wall, Cardinal Supage's representative for the Illinois Patrons. It's my honor to invite you to join us in protecting the priceless cultural wonders of these most important Vatican museums so that they may continue to inspire people from around the world for generations to come. Your membership will support ongoing restoration work and critical conservation projects along with capital improvements and the critical equipment needed for the restoration laboratories. Your support will also allow for the acquisition of valuable artwork and hiring and development of highly specialized restorers. In addition to these deep satisfaction that comes from your participation in these conservation and restoration projects, other significant benefits of membership include complimentary entrance and tour of the Vatican Museums, the ability to view some areas of the museum close to the public, and the opportunity to tour the restoration laboratories. You will also receive a subscription to the Patron of the Arts newsletter from the International Director, and invitations to Illinois chapter members only events and fundraising events. So I enthusiastically invite you to become a patron. Membership dues uh, are $250 for clergy members, $250 for associate members under 35, $600 for an individual membership, and $1,200 for a family membership that includes two adults and children under 18. So contact us. You can reach us at the, our website, vaticanpatronschicago.org slash membership, or call us at 312-534-5351 or you can email us at illinoispatrons at gmail.com. Thank you so very, very much for your interest and your support. Thank you, Father Wall, and thank you for being with us this evening. Our final Rosa Mystica program is scheduled for October. We will be in touch with the exact date and time. The title is Mary, Sign of Glory. During this program, we will show the final restoration of the stunning Annunciation painting that through a video, Father Camelli showed us at the beginning of the series. We will also have announcements for a 2022 trip to Rome and the Vatican Museums. Once again, thank you for joining us and please come again in October. Have a good evening. <music>